I'm not sure if Joyce got me out or she let me out of here. She gives quite a sound, but I don't think so. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the delay. We're just going to wait a few more seconds so everyone can log in. All right, well, welcome everyone to Harvard I Associates webinar. My name is Christine and I will be your moderator this evening. We're so happy you can join us. Um, our presenter tonight is Dr. Diana Kirsten. Dr. Kirsten is a board certified ophthalmologist that specializes in cataracts, refractive surgery, and anterior segment disease. She joined Harvard Eye Associates in 1988 and has been devoted to providing her patients with the best possible care through her warm, thorough approach and meticulous attention to detail. Um, we are going to have Dr. Kirsten uh, do her presentation and then save uh, some time at the end for some Q&As. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our presenter tonight, Dr. Diana Kirsten. Thank you, Christine, and thanks everyone for logging on. This is my first Zoom seminar, so it's a little strange talking to a computer screen. Um, but you can type in questions to Christine and um, we're happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for being uh, loyal to Harvard Eye Associates and being you know, our, our very valuable patients and especially during this time of the COVID pandemic. Um, we wanna assure you that we're doing everything possible to stay safe and to keep our patients safe, our staff safe and um, to stay safe ourselves. And we take it very seriously and we're very, to have, very happy to have you with us. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's new in cataract surgery and I realized as I was doing the talk, it's a pretty vast subject. There's a lot in cataract surgery right now. Uh, it's a technology that's always growing and there's so many things that are going on now. Um, there's eight of us that do cataract surgery with Harvard Eye and um, I'm one of the cataract surgeons, but we have eight very good uh, cataract surgeons. Um, so if you have questions, we'll answer them at the end and I'll, I'll go th through the uh, slides fairly briefly. Um, the big thing that's new in cataract surgery is that it's refractive, meaning it's more like LASIK than it has ever been in the past. Refractive you know, has to do with your uncorrected vision after the surgery, and there's so many options. Um, our measurements and our results are more exact than they've ever been. We have more options than we've ever had, and we have better results than we've ever had before. And just briefly to go over what a cataract is, it's when the lens of the eye gets cloudy. And this is a fairly um, advanced cataract. Most people don't wait to this level. This is a mature cataract. But the lens of the eye is right behind your pupil and it's you know with you your entire life. It's nice and clear uh, when we're a, a child. And then usually somewhere after the age of 60, although sometimes earlier, it becomes cloudy and that is a cataract. So this briefly goes through modern cataract surgery. Um, and Usually. basically uh, your eyes numbed up and you have a little IV sedation and the surgeon makes a little incision into the anterior chamber, removes the top of the lens capsule and then using a little ultrasound probe uh, emulsifies and vacuums all of the cloudy lens out of your eye. The only part remaining is the capsule and the implant rolls up into a little tube and when it's inserted, it goes right into that capsule or bag. And uh, 
that is modern cataract surgery. There's variations on that using a laser and other things that we'll go over in a minute. The intraocular lens that's placed in your eye is your new lens. Uh, your own lens has about 20 diopters of focusing power. So the new lens uh, has 20 or sometimes less or more depending on your prescription. Um, and it sits right behind your pupil and what's holding it in place is exactly what held your, your own implant in place. And um, the implant looks kind of like this. It's a little round six millimeter um, flat lens. These little loopy parts are called haptics and they keep the implant centered. Uh, this is a monofocal implant, meaning it has one power to it. So this implant, for example, could give you good distance vision, but you'd need to wear reading glasses for close up. So um, in general, um, I'm hoping if this I can see my slide because I can't see on my slides. Maybe, maybe. Great, okay, perfect, thanks. Um, so one of the main places where you have an option is with your choice of intraocular lenses. And just to go over it kind of briefly, um, the implants that are covered by insurance are called monofocal. And if you don't have astigmatism and uh, this is what you want, then this could correct your eye for one distance. And for example, a lot of people have cataract surgery, so their distance vision's good, and then they wear reading glasses. Uh, and that's historically a common way to, to do the surgery um, going back 20, 30 years. You can also have one eye done for distance and one eye for near. Or some people who've always been near sight and had good reading vision, they'll elect to have a monofocal implant with good reading vision. If you have a lot of astigmatism, then a toric implant is a good, um, a good lens because it corrects your astigmatism, but it still only corrects for one distance. So if you have a lot of astigmatism, you can have a toric implant for distance or for near or, or monovision, one distance and one near. There is an added cost for the toric implant. Um, we're not gonna really go into exactly the charges at this uh, time, um, but if any of you have questions about it, you can type those in at the end and we can have one of our counselors uh, call you and, and confirm about that. Um, multifocal implants have been around for about 20 years and they're also not covered by insurance. And um, this is a technology that keeps getting better and better and we're fortunate in that there are two or three companies who uh, keep coming out with better multifocal implants. And um, the current one that's the most popular is called the Panoptics by Alcon and um, the Symphony by Johnson & Johnson. And um, the Panoptics in particular is an implant that gives you good distance vision, mid-range, close vision, it really functions kind of like a progressive bifocal, and that's been a, a very popular lens uh, recently. The multifocal lens has also come in a astigmatism correcting toric version. And then just recently, the light adjustable lens was uh, FDA approved, and uh, I'll talk about that in a, a minute. So this is a toric implant, and you can see it looks like the monofocal implant, but it has these little, little uh, marks on it. And this is where the astigmatism, uh, the steep axis of the astigmatism is here. So when we put this implant in, we rotate it until it's in the right axis. Um, and we have ways of getting it perfectly aligned. And this is how the lens corrects your astigmatism. And this is a multifocal implant. This is a somewhat older version. All the multifocal implants have rings. So the center part, for example, is distance. Um, the next ring is near, then distance and near. So um, these implants historically have had some issues with halos with night driving, but with the better, more updated uh, versions that technologies brought us, the halos are much, much less of an issue. And we'll talk about um, the panoptics, which currently is the most used uh, multifocal implant in the US. And um, the great thing about it is that it really is like a progressive uh, bifocal or trifocal. Um, 
it's very easy for the patients to adapt to. Um, you really don't have to think about it uh, because it's a circular design. What you look at is what you see. It's not an up and down design where you have to look down to read. And um, the way that it's designed, it's much less likely to cause halos or visual disturbances or quality of vision issues, which had been a problem a little bit uh, to some degree with previous implants, with previous multifocal implants. Um, so this has been a very popular implant recently. It, it, there is an out of pocket charge for it. Um, it's generally put in both eyes, although sometimes it's only used in one eye and a regular lens in the other eye for different reasons. Um, and the quality of vision with the implant is really excellent. Um, in a recent survey, 99.2% of patients surveyed said that who'd had the, this implant said that they would select the pen optics again. And um, we have really never had a multifocal implant which, with such high um, survey ratings. So this has been very popular. And like all of the multifocal lenses, it comes in a toric version. Um, the great thing about all the toric implants now is we can correct uh, up to six diopters of astigmatism, which is a really large amount of astigmatism. So you can take someone who wears Coke bottle glasses, huge amounts of astigmatism, and by putting this lens in and rotating it to the right axis, you know, really give them excellent vision without glasses. So it's been very exciting to have this new technology. This is the new um, Vividi implant and it is, um, I'll show this again. It is brand new, I actually haven't used it yet. It's an extended depth of focus uh, implant. It has a little area in the center that's elevated that um, provides a, a better depth of focus. And it's generally done with one eye for distance and the other eye slightly nearsighted. The advantage of it, it gives very, very excellent quality of vision, generally distance and mid-range. Very often one eye is done for distance and the other eye is slightly nearsighted. Uh, it was approved quite recently within the last two or three months. And it's also available in a toric version. And, and again, as with all of these um, to advanced technology implants, unfortunately there is an out-of-pocket charge for them. And then the very exciting lens that just came out and has been in process for 20 or more years is the light adjustable implant. And this is very exciting because this is the first implant where we can put it in the eye and then two or three weeks after surgery, we can change the power. And there's a lot of patients that have cataract surgery who've had LASIK or radial keratotomy or they have a very unusual eye, they're extremely far-sighted or near-sighted, and, or they need extremely precise vision. Uh, so this implant is amazing because you can basically give the patient absolutely perfect vision. And um, it's a three-piece silicone implant, uh, and the lens is easy to put in, and um, this will tell you a little bit about it. Here there is now a new advanced IOL that can be adjusted after your eye is healed to give you a lens personalized to you, just like a prescription for glasses would. RX Sight's light adjustable lens allows your eye doctor to change the power of your new IOL using UV light. The special silicone material of the light adjustable lens reacts to UV light and changes shape to match the prescription you and your doctor select during a routine eye exam. When you choose the light adjustable lens, the surgery experience will be just like the one for a standard IOL. So um, we've just started using this off uh, this lens. This finishes up that presentation. There is now a new advanced IOL that can be adjusted after your eye is healed to give you a lens personalized to you. There we go. After your eye is healed from surgery, your eye doctor will examine your eye and perform the first light treatment, which takes around 90 seconds in your doctor's office. 
between two and four total light treatments, each separated by three days on a glass. The necessity of additional light treatment is based on achievement of your desired outcome. 24 hours after your final light treatment, you will be able to enjoy your new custom vision without the UV protective glasses. So um, with this implant, there's a few things. You have to wear these kind of uh, UV protecting glasses until you have your... Um, your adjustments so that you don't get too much UV light into your eyes, but it's only for two or three weeks. Um, we're all excited about this. It comes in a, a astigmatism correcting version. Um, I think it'll be great for patients who've had radial keratotomy or who have had LASIK. Um, these patients are historically a little more difficult to get um, the vision exactly corrected. And um, so we're very excited uh, about it. Um, I think we did our first one a, a few weeks ago because it was just, well, actually it was just FDA approved right before the pandemic. So um, this is a lens you're gonna hear a, a lot about because um, there's a lot of buzz around, about it right now. After you're up. All right, so when you and your cataract surgeon talk about what's the best in, intraocular lens for your eyes, there's a lot of things to, to think about. Um, you know, is the extra cost affordable for some of the new technology implants? What's the health of, of your eyes if someone has macular degeneration or severe glaucoma? Some of these implants may not be appropriate or advisable. Have you done monovision with contact lenses or with LASIK? Then monovision might be the best option for you. How much astigmatism do you have? But the, the big thing I'd like to make sure everyone realizes is that your eyes are quite unique. And the best implant for you is not necessarily the best implant for your family members or your neighbors. Um, patients come in all the time and say, well, I want this implant, but they don't realize they have macular degeneration. It's really not the best implant. Or um, they, things can be rather complicated about which implant's best for you. So um, I usually think the best idea is to have a cataract surgeon you really trust and ask them, what would you do if I was your sister or your mother? You know, what do you think would be really best for me and get their very valuable opinion about, about your options? Um, the next topic's about making cataract surgery more exact and more precise. And the aura is uh, OptiWave Refractive Analysis. And it's basically a camera that's attached to our microscope in the operating room. And it helps us to calculate the power of your implant during the surgery. So the power is calculated at your pre-op visit with a machine called an IOL master. And for some patients, it's difficult to measure because you've had uh, LASIK or your cornea is irregular or your cataract's very dense. So this method remeasures your eye during surgery using a totally different methodology. And it definitely gives us more accurate post-op results. Um, when we do this, we line up, this is the patient's eye during surgery. We line up all of these parameters. We hit capture, it takes 40 photos of the light reflex from your pupil and analyzes that. And then we get a screen that tells us which implant to use. All of your data is preloaded into the machine. So on the day of surgery, we pull up your name and your data. And um, this is the operating microscope and the aura is on the very bottom. So there's a little extra charge uh, for this. It's about $550. Um, for patients who want very precise vision for distance or monovision or patients who've had LASIK, it's really invaluable in getting um, your vision uh, sharper and um, more clear because your implant power is what determines how clear your uncorrected vision is. Um, and the next uh, thing to go over is femtosecond laser cataract surgery. And this is where a laser does the first part of the cataract surgery. It's also called FLAX, femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. And if you select this uh, option, um, there's a pre-treatment with the laser in, a, in, our, in our operating rooms. We have a separate laser room. And then you're brought into the actual OR to start the surgery. 
And rather than the surgeon making the incisions and uh, doing everything by hand, the laser does the entire first part of the surgery in a very, very accurate and precise uh, manner. And this has been out for about uh, seven years. And this shows you, uh, we happen to have the LensX laser, which is Alcon's. There's several different uh, companies make femtosecond lasers. And this shows a standard CAC surgery uh, on the right. This kind of shows you what this it is. This step is performed by the surgeon manually creating a circular opening with a handheld instrument. The LensX laser offers your surgeon laser precision to create the circular opening and allows the lens placed to have the best possible effective lens position. This allows you to experience the most predictable post-operative results. Standard cataract surgery requires a fecal emulsification machine to segment and remove the content of the cataract. The goal of your surgeon is to reduce the amount of energy used to remove your cataract. The LensX laser performs lens fragmentation, creating easily dissected segments for efficient removal with little or no energy from the lens removal device. Reducing energy during the phaco emulsification step has been shown in studies to assist in healing and can be much less damaging than phaco energy during standard surgery. The LensX laser offers enhanced levels of precision and reproducibility. In so the femtosecond laser is also, you know, very popular. Um, there is an out-of-profit charge, so it, it may not be for everyone. Um, we all love doing it this way because everything is so accurate and precise, but the traditional way of the surgeon making all of the incisions um, it can also work quite well. The real advantage of the femtosecond is it corrects astigmatism beautifully, uh, and it makes the uh, Capsule, capsule the opening in the anterior capsule, exactly centered, exactly the right size. So the implant uh, sits in the eye in a very precise way. This step is perfect. So important points to consider about cataract surgery. Um, is the eye otherwise healthy? Are there any retinal issues, corneal issues, or other issues? Um, your cataract surgeon should go over this with you. If you have an irregular cornea or um, an extremely dry eye or macular degeneration or an upper retinal membrane, then one implant or one way of doing the surgery may be better than another. Um, does the eye have a lot of astigmatism? And here we're looking at corneal astigmatism. And if so, if you want to see well without glasses, you'll have to have your astigmatism treated in, in some way, usually with a toric implant or with corneal incisions. Do you want to avoid wearing glasses after surgery? I have patients who tell me they love their glasses. They don't want to get rid of their glasses. So maybe the traditional way is, is the way to go for those patients. Um, has a patient had LASIK, radiocartonomy, or any other refractive surgery, in which case it's harder to get the implant power exactly um, calculated and the aura is especially important. And as a patient tried monovision, one eye distance, one eye near. Um, if you've tried it, then that's a good thing to consider when you have cataract surgery. If you've never tried it, cataract surgery usually isn't the best time to start trying monovision. It's generally for people who've done it in the past. Um, but I think the most important thing is a really good careful and thorough discussion with your cataract surgeon about the best way to do the surgery, um, what would be best for you, um, and all of the options. And, um, and so I kind of went through this very briefly. Um, I've done this talk a lot in the clinic and there's always a lot of questions. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. I think you just type in the questions to Christine. Yes, we do have some questions here, Dr. Kirsten. Okay. Uh, the first one is, can the pan optics work for everyone? Um, that's a really good question. So the, the pan optics, um, it, it works well as long as your eye, eyes are healthy. Um, any multifocal implant, uh, 
will have issues if you have any, um, you know, fairly marked problems with your macula or your cornea, or if there's some reason that your eye can't see clearly besides the cataract, then the panoptics may not be the best lens for you. Um, I have a, a, a number of patients that have a macular problem in their left eye, for example, but the right eye is perfectly healthy and they have the panoptics in their right eye. But because the macular problem in the left eye means the panoptics may not work as well, um, they'll just get a, a standard lens in the left eye and it works quite well. They see distance, the right eye sees near, they're not having to put reading glasses on as much. Um, so the answer is no, there, it's not for everyone. You have to have a, you know, a, a pretty healthy eye in order to um, have the advantage of the panoptics implant. Great. Um, can one eye be done at a time? Yes, so generally one eye is done at a time with cataract surgery. There are um, some places now that are doing one eye at a time, uh, that are doing both eyes at the same time. That is becoming more common. Traditionally though, um, it's always been one eye and then two or three, three weeks later, the other eye. Partly because of safety, partly um, because there is a one in a thousand risk of infection or endophthalmitis when you have cataract surgery. So obviously if you just do one eye at a time, there's only that one in a thousand risk for the one eye. Um, but also because it's easier on the patient. When you um, have one eye done, the other one's fine and you can get by better. And then two, three weeks later when the first eye's healed up, you, you have the second eye done. Um, but it is becoming a lot more common to have both eyes done the same day. And with the light adjustable lens, um, a lot of doctors are talking about doing both eyes the same day because then you can have the light adjustment done uh, on the same day for both eyes. So it makes it more efficient. And I think we'll see a trend more and more that way uh, in, in the future that both eyes will be done the same day more and more. Um, I was told by an ophthalmologist that due to eye measurements, he does not recommend panoptics, but crystal lens, which mm -hmm. tons of complaints. He would like a second opinion. Do you recommend crystal lens? So crystal lens is a really interesting implant. Um, you know, it was developed in Orange County um, and it was very, very, very popular in uh, like 13, 14 years ago. And a lot of people still use it quite a bit. And um, it's one of those lenses that some people really love and still use and get good results. And others of us, and, and again, my, my talk kind of showed what I like, which is more of the, the multifocal lenses right now. Um, but I know some excellent, excellent cataract surgeons who use a lot of crystal lens and, and, and really like it. And the advantage of crystal lens is that the optic is one power. So historically, the, the multifocal implants have had a little image, a little issue with quality of vision. It, it's getting better and better, and the panoptics I think is really excellent. But crystal lens, because the optic is one power, hasn't had that as much. And crystal lens vaults forward and back um, when you accommodate, and that is how it works. And my issue with crystal lens is that it doesn't work the same way in everyone. So in some people, it seems to work quite well and other people, it not as well. And so um, I think it's always a reasonable lens to consider, especially for a, doc, a surgeon who really likes it. But I think getting a second opinion is you know, always a good thought, especially if you're not sure which way you want to have it done. Um, you know, surgeons are, we're all different. We all have different ways of looking at things. We all, you know, one of my partners does a lot more femtosecond lasers than I do, for example. And I think I really love the panoptics lens because I see how well it works for my patients. Uh, and so you're going to find a variability in, in what surgeons recommend. But I think second opinions are always a great thing. I only have cataract in one eye, is this possible? Mm -hmm. Most people get cataracts in both eyes 
you know, similarly, or one's a little worse than the other, but some people for different reasons get a cack in one eye and the other eye's fine. Um, maybe you had trauma when you were a kid, maybe you had to put steroid eye, eye drops in for something. Um, you know, a lot of people just get a cataract in one eye and you always have to consider what the other eye is like. If the other eye is really nearsighted and you don't wear contacts, then you kind of have to do, you know, the cataract eye so that you'll be able to wear glasses. And so it's close enough to the, um, you know, to the eye that's not having cataract surgery. Um, but no, a lot of people just get a cataract in one eye and have, have cataract surgery in the one eye. Um, what is an astigmatism? Um, so astigmatism is, um, it's a irregularity in the cornea and the cornea is the clear window of the eye. So um, the way I like to think of it is that if the, the cornea is like a little hill, a clear little hill, um, it's steeper in one direction to, to walk over the hill and the other direction it's flatter. And um, so if you have astigmatism, you need glasses that correct that or a contact that corrects it or a hard contact that just flattens the cornea and, and gets rid of that astigmatism. And um, for small amounts of astigmatism, we can sometimes make incisions in the peripheral cornea and that reduces the astigmatism. But the most accurate way of correcting astigmatism is with a, a toric implant where um, we calculate if you have two diopters of astigmatism on your cornea, then we pick the toric implant that has two diopters of astigmatism, put it in your eye. We line it up with the aura and the aura tells us when we're exactly lined up. And typically that does a great job at correcting your astigmatism. There's a small incidence, maybe two or 3% of the toric implant rotating um, and not exactly fully correcting the astigmatism, but that can be treated um, a few weeks later. Okay, how many years should I wait before getting lens implants after developing cataract? So when to have cataract surgery is a really individual um, decision and something to talk, you know, talk to your cataract surgeon or your ophthalmologist, your optometrist about. We work a lot with um, all the local optometrists and we're really lucky in Orange County to have a optometry school in Fullerton and so many really excellent optometrists out in the community. A lot of times they can tell you when is the right time. Um, I, I always let the patient know, you know, you're not gonna pass the DMV if, if that's the case. So sometime before your next DMV, DMV exam, you're gonna wanna have your cataracts done. But if, if patients can still pass a DMV and aren't really bothered, I generally just see them yearly and let them know if it starts to bother them to, to call in. Um, I, I think it's quite variable when's the right time. Obviously a 90 year old little lady who's you know, in a retirement home and not driving, maybe wants to wait later than someone who's 64 and is out driving at night on the freeway. So um, I think it's a very individual choice. Um, in general, people have cataract surgery earlier today than they did 30 years ago when I first started here. And, and that's, I think, because the results are so much better and things are so much more accurate. Um, but it, it is an individual thing to discuss with your surgeon. Um, if a film develops on your IOL, who recommends the cleanup and also who performs it? Sure, so um, uh, as we showed when we were uh, showing the um, cataract surgery, the only part of your original lens that stays in place is the capsule in the back. And um, that, in fact, I might go back to that um, video here. So that capsule um, stays in your eye and it's right behind the implant here. So it's nice and clear at the end of the cataract surgery but then with time, cells from inside the eye migrate over that posterior capsule and make it cloudy. It happens sooner if you're younger, typically. It often happens later if you're older, but it's, it's quite variable how quickly it happens. It can be two months later, six months later. Most commonly it's at 
a year or two. So what we do for that is a very simple laser. It just makes a hole in that capsule right behind the implant. Um, you're sitting up for the laser. It doesn't hurt. It's covered by insurance. It's very routine. It's more like a little, you know, office visit than it is a procedure. And um, so uh, currently ophthalmologists um, do that. And again, very often you're, you know, your optometrist you may see and go, oh, you've got a cloudy capsule. Now I'm going to refer you back to your cataract surgeon to get that laser done. Um, probably 70% plus of patients that have cataract surgery end up needing that laser. It's called a YAG laser. That's just the type of, of laser. And it's, it's very routine and nothing to worry about, very low on any kind of risks. Okay, um, how long will each implant last? So um, the implants today are really well made. They're made out of, um, most of them out of this amazing material called acrylic. Um, and they'll last for a hundred years. So the implants we put into someone who's 80 years old are the same ones I just put in a patient that was 24 years old that had a traumatic cataract. So they're really made to last um, a long, long time, certainly uh, anyone's lifespan. Um, it's very rare to have to remove an implant and replace it. And that's generally because of um, the implants moving or there's an issue with it. But once in a great while, we need to do something like that, but that's very, very rare. If you're not happy with your vision after cataract surgery, can you replace and get an upgrade, upgraded lens? Um, so you can have a what we call an IOL exchange. Um, and that's usually, well, it's not very common. It was done um, early on with some of the multifocal lenses that gave some uh, image issues and quality vision issues that the patient really didn't like their vision with the multifocal lens. We would sometimes remove it, put in a regular implant. You have to do it fairly early on though because um, the capsule of your old lens, it kind of contracts around the implant, sort of shrink wraps around it. And um, so if you wait too long until that lens is really ensconced in that you know, contracted capsule, it's harder to remove it and replace it. Um, usually if you've had an implant in your eye for a long time, it's, it's fairly hard to remove, but, but possible. Um, and, um, I think if you're really unhappy with your vision after cataract surgery, you know, I have a good talk with your ophthalmologist or your optometrist, see what they think, you know, get second opinions, see what other doctors think. Um, it, it is done, it can be done, but it's just not very common because, you have to go back inside the eye and sometimes, um, you know, there's risks of infection and, and other things. So um, what, what is more common than removing your implant or replacing it is doing a touch up with a LASIK kind of a procedure. Um, cataract surgery is pretty accurate these days, but it's still fairly common for someone to end up a little nearsighted or a little farsighted, a little bit of remaining astigmatism. Um, when we choose an implant, for example, a 20.0 diopter implant, the companies only guarantee that plus or minus half a diopter. So that's why it's so common to be a little bit off. And when someone wants one eye distance, one eye near, and their distance eyes half a diopter nearsighted, they're usually not, not real happy about that. But that can happen even if the surgeon did everything right. And so usually what we do in that case is um, a little touch up with, with a LASIK kind of a procedure to get everything more perfect. Are there any downsides to femto's second laser? Um, that's a really good question. So I, the main downside is that it, it costs more. Um, other than that, some people get a little redness on their eye from it because there's a little ring that fits on the eye and has to kind of hold on so that the the platform you know, that the laser's connected to doesn't move. So some people get a little subconjunctival hemorrhage, a little redness. Um, 
it's it, it has a learning curve. So if you're if a surgeon's just starting with it and you're one of the first patients, you know, there, there's probably a little more risk. But once once a surgeon's been doing it for a long time, it's it's very, very accurate. In the very beginning, there were some issues though um, that the laser companies worked out. And I think now it's it's very safe. Um, I got an early cataract in my left eye for different reasons. And I, I had my cataract removed with a, um, with a femtosecond laser procedure. And I thought it was, it was great. Um, it is more expensive. So, you know, we're very aware that not, it's not on everyone's budget, but it's a very accurate, great way to do it. I'm really scared of any surgery around my eyes. How sedated will I be? So that's one of the really great things about cataract surgery is that you know currently insurance covers an anesthesiologist and and we mainly operate at Alicia Surgery Center, but sometimes at Mission Surgery Center. And there's just great anesthesiologists at both both locations. So you let the anesthesiologist know how sedated you want to be, how asleep you want to be. And we don't do general anesthesia with the breathing tube and everything, but but they can keep you, you know, totally asleep during the surgery. And a lot of patients ask for that. So it, it's not a problem at all. And generally when someone's nervous about cataract surgery and they come in and they have their first eye done, after that, they're so much more relaxed because it's it's typically the easiest surgery you could ever have. It's 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you're as sedated as you want to be, and the results are a positive thing. It's, you know, it's half the reason I went into ophthalmology is I like doing surgery and I like having positive results. And um, so I, I, I wouldn't be nervous about, about that. You, we can always make you so you're, you're very comfortable. Um, are dry eyes bad for cataract surgery? So um, that's a really good question. So dry eyes are epidemic in Southern California and every, everywhere that there's really dry weather. And um, I have dry eyes. So I, I always feel like I can tell how much humidity is in the air at any given time by how my eyes feel. And um, so any eye surgery that you have, um, especially LASIK actually, because the LASIK flap is, really hard on dry eyes. But cataract surgery also, even though the incisions for cataract surgery are, you know, just a little over two millimeters at the edge of the uh, cornea, but anything you do to the cornea, to the eye can make the eye feel more dry. And it somewhat has to do with uh, cutting through some corneal nerves and the cornea being a little denervated. And generally when that happens, we treat you with all kinds of extra drops and plugs in your lacrimal drainage puncta and ointments at night and um, you know other kinds of medication and after you know two three months it gets better but um, I think if you have profoundly dry eyes then you should have a good talk with your optometrist and your ophthalmologist about you know which implant would be best because if your eyes are extremely dry then one implant might be better than the other. Um, but generally the feeling is that any worsening of dry eyes from cataract surgery does get better after a few months. Um, though I have to say, I've seen a few people who swear that cataract surgery is the point at which their dry eyes really started to bother them. Um, so it is an issue. And what lens would you recommend for dry eyes? Well, if, if your eyes are really profoundly dry, then, and by profoundly dry, I mean, you know, stippling on your cornea where we put the yellow dye in and the whole cornea looks like, you know, you took a Brillo pad to it and very rough. Then, I mean, that would constitute an eye that may not do well with a multifocal lens. And um, the problem is because you really want everything else to be nice and clear and the macula to be good and the, cornea to be nice and clear for a, a multifocal lens to work well. The problem is sometimes we evaluate someone pre-op and they don't look that dry. Maybe it's very humid or it's the rainy season. And then 
or you know maybe they don't really have a dry eye and after cat surgery they do so it can be a little bit tricky but um but that's the main main thing i think is if your eyes are very dry perhaps a multifocal implant you know would be something to really think about and discuss with your with your eye doctors okay um if I have cataract surgery on one eye and I don't have to, and my optometrist says I don't need the other eye for another three to four years, would you wait until it becomes a problem or should I correct it now? Sure. Well, so that has a lot to do with, um, and, and, you know, this is one of those things that usually involves a big discussion, but let's say you're really nearsighted, you know, Coke bottle nearsighted glasses, and one eye gets a cataract. And you've always wanted to have good distance vision. So just a simple cataract surgery with the right implant, you've got good distance vision, but you can't have minus 10 on one eye and no prescription either. I just can't wear glasses. It'll, you'll, it just doesn't work. So sometimes in a case like that, um, well, you'll wear a contact and that works, but other times, um, just to get the eyes back in balance, you'll do a cataract surgery at an earlier level on the second eye. Um, but it's usually for that reason to keep the eyes in balance. And um, so it, it, it is sometimes done and, and there's a procedure called a clear uh, lens exchange that's actually done kind of like LASIK. It's out of pocket expense. It's um, not really done because you have a cataract. It's done for refractive reasons. Um, especially for farsighted people who are, you know, maybe over 45. Um, and early cataract surgery is done even before a cataract forms in order to put an implant in so that they can see well. So um, yeah, I, I, I'd say sometimes the second eye has to be done early in order to balance the eyes. Does cataract surgery reduce eye pressure? So that's a very good question also. Um, in general, um, cataract surgery generally reduces your eye pressure by a small amount, usually a couple of millimeters of mercury. Um, sometimes if you have a shallow chamber or uh, narrow angles, cataract surgery can reduce uh, your eye pressure even more. And uh, another new part of cataract surgery that I didn't really get into is glaucoma procedures that are done at the same time. Um, and this started um, with um, a company called Glaucos, which is an amazing local company and a local ophthalmologist. A lot of the innovation for all this technology takes place right here in Orange County, which is, which is really great. So um, Rick Hill, who is a great glaucoma doctor at, at UCI and then in private practice, first came up with the idea of putting, um, of, of at the end of cataract surgery, doing something to the drainage angle of the eye. And he developed the eye stent, which is a little drainage stent that um, you do cataract surgery and then you turn the patient's head to the side and put a little drainage stent into the trabecular meshwork of the nasal part of the eye. And now there's other um, uh, drainage angle procedures, goniotomies and omni and, there's multiple companies now that have these great products. So if you have glaucoma and you have cataract surgery, then um, there's often uh, your surgeon will recommend, well, when we're there doing the cataract surgery, let's also do this little glaucoma procedure. Um, and these are generally covered by insurance and very safe. And then with many of them, you get pressure lowering of four points or even more. Um, so it's, it's really, cataract surgery is broadened to become a procedure that also really helps glaucoma. Okay, um, just a few more. Mm -hmm. uh, how many days should an out-of-town patient need to be in town for the exam and the surgery and the follow-up? And how long is the recovery period for each eye? Sure, so um, we have a lot of patients that come in from out of town. It's actually quite common. and. Our counselors for surgery are really great at um, coordinating everything. So generally you have to have your measurements done for the implant power. Um, the surgery center really likes to have what implant we're using a week ahead. So they know they have it and they can order it if they, they don't have it. Although the surgery centers generally have 
you know, most of the implant power is in stock. So usually you'd come, you know, maybe eight days ahead, have the measurements done. Um, you know, depending on how far you're coming from, you can come do that a couple of weeks ahead, then come back for the surgery. I like to have patients in town. You know, if I, I do Tuesday surgery usually, so I have to see you on Wednesday, you could leave on Thursday, as long as you live somewhere that if something happened, you got any symptoms, there'd be, you know, an optometrist or an ophthalmologist locally who could check you if something unusual happened, but generally just a couple of days afterwards. Great. Um, is it true that as we age, the cataract is more rigid and harder to remove? So it, in general, yes. So any cataract surgeon can tell you that it's much easier to remove a 55-year-old's cataract usually than a 95-year-old's cataract because they tend to get more dense and the nucleus gets thicker and more brown and they can become very, very um, dense like a rock. And we're trying to use a, um, a FACO handpiece, which has an ultrasonic tip to break this thing up. So if it's a softer lens, it, it can come out quite easily. If it's a very dense lens, which tends to be people who are older, it can be very hard to remove. Sometimes we even have to uh, make the incision larger, you know, nine millimeters, eight or nine millimeters. And remove the whole nucleus um, in one piece. That's called converting to an extracapsular surgery because of the nucleus is just too dense to ultrasound into fragments. Um, so yeah, that, that is true. Patients ask me all the time about that though. Like, oh, is it dangerous to let the cataract go on because it'll be more difficult to do? And that's really on a case by case basis. I, I see patients like that though where I've been seeing them for years and now they're 90 and I think, oh, please, let's do your cataract surgery now because if we do it in a year or two or three, it's just going to be harder and harder to do it and not have an issue come up and not have a complication because there's definitely a higher rate of complication when you're operating on a rock hard cataract. Um, is the laser or the blade better for um, healing quicker? So that's a very good question. And honestly, that's debated a lot in ophthalmology meetings. And um, truthfully, I don't think anyone knows. Um, the primary incision, um, the great thing about the femtosecond laser is it makes it perfectly. It always seals well, pretty much never have to suture it. But the blades now, you know, when we make the incision, the blades come in exactly 2.2 millimeters or 2.4 millimeters. And, and they heal up really beautifully as well. Um, so it's a hard question to answer, honestly. There've been lots of studies looking at, oh, is a femtosecond better or is traditional surgery just as good? And, and I, I think the femtoseconds you know, really great, especially at the capsule arexis, removing the top of the lens capsule, at dividing lens into fragments, especially if it's a very dense lens, because then we can remove that very dense lens with less ultrasound power, and the ultrasound is not friendly to the cornea. Um, for the incisions, it's probably not quite as important. Um, I think my personal opinion is the incisions with the laser, incisions with the little blade are probably you know, fairly comparable, but other doctors might feel differently. Um, any concerns or recommendations for people with posterior vitreous detachment? Sure, so um, a posterior vitreous detachment or PVD is a really common event. And it's one of, it's probably other than conjunctivitis, the most common thing we see as an emergency in our office. And what happens there is the vitreous gel, which is right behind the lens, um, it changes a lot in character in our lifetime. And usually at a certain point, generally after age 45 or so, it contracts a little and it pulls away from where it's attached to the back of the eye, to the optic nerve and the macula and the blood vessels. And when it pulls away, people start to see floaters. 
And it's very unusual and people are kind of freaked out over it quite often. And you really should come in and get checked because when this happens, there's a chance that you could have a torn retina or you could have a detached retina. And if you have a torn retina, for example, you need to have that treated usually with a laser to prevent a detached retina. So of all the PVDs we see, you know, it's probably less than, well, certainly less than 10% or maybe about 5% or so that have a torn retina. So probably you don't, but you still should get checked because having a detached retina is a big deal. It's usually a surgery. Um, you don't always recover your vision. Um, it's kind of a big deal. So we recommend anyone with new floaters and flashes should call you know, your optometrist or your ophthalmologist and, and get that checked to make sure there's, there's not a torn retina. Um, I have strabismus, so I don't focus with my right eye. Um, my distance vision is very poor in my left eye. Can it be corrected and still have excellent close-up vision? So I assume that you have a cataract in the left eye. Um, and so it's, this sounds like your case is, a, you know, you kind of have to know a little more of the details of it, but we have a lot of patients that just, we have one good eye and one eye's got amblyopia or another problem like that or strabismus. So um, I think as my comfort has grown with the panoptics lens, I'm now putting it in patients that have one good eye. I feel like I'm getting such good results with it. Um, so, you know, unless there's other things going on, you, you could have a, a panoptics lens put in your left eye and see distance and mid and close up with that eye. Um, I don't know if all ophthalmologists would do that or feel as comfortable, but, but I certainly do. But everything else would have to be perfect with, with the eye. And there may be other factors that I don't know about in your case that, you know, we'd have to discuss. Mm -hmm. Um, how many days would I have to be off blood thinners in order to get the surgery? And does my sleep apnea affect it? Um, so the great thing about cataract surgery is we don't even lose a tenth of a drop of blood. Um, it's a totally bloodless surgery. And so a lot of our patients are on Plavix and they're on baby aspirin and, and other things. And that's, that's fine. Um, a lot, a lot of people just can't go off of these things um, medically. Um, and so generally it's, it's really not an issue. It's incredibly rare to have any bleeding. Um, sleep apnea isn't a problem. Assuming you have sleep apnea and you're wearing, you know, um, you know a night breathing machine. And um, I mean, some of those make your eyes kind of dry. That's the one issue, but most CPAP, most machines like that will keep your, you know, sleep apnea under control. You certainly want to wear the, the you know, clear shield at night when you sleep so you don't bump your eye or rub your eye at night, especially if you have sleep apnea and it might be waking up suddenly, but otherwise it's not a problem. Okay, great. And one more question. Um, are you performing surgery during the coronavirus? Yeah, so we, we weren't in the, you know, when there was the lockdown starting in late March, um, our surgery center was closed. And um, so we were closed from the end of March until early May when the governor, you know, said surgery centers with our specialty could reopen. Um, not only in our office, but also at our surgery center, we're incredibly, incredibly careful, as you can imagine. It's probably one of the safer places to be during this pandemic, certainly safer than the grocery store or shopping, things like that. Um, so we, we are open and at, at when we first came back in May and June, it was a little slow. It's steadily gotten busier and busier. So we're pretty much back to full capacity. I think there was so much backed up need for cataract surgery and, and things to be done that the whole, the patients that were waiting and got delayed are all coming in now and, and we're actually quite busy and, um, and very, very safe. Um, so we're following all the recommended guidelines and then some in our, in our office and our surgery center. 
Okay, one more question, Dr. Keenan. How many years have you been performing cataract surgery? Um, so, well, I've been here since 1988, so 32 years. And, um, and I guess I did my first cataract surgery in 1983. So I'm aging myself big time. Um, so a long time. Yeah. And, uh, and I really enjoy it. And I, it's such a great time to be an ophthalmologist. For one thing, the numbers of cataract surgeries keep going up. There are four, four and a half million cataract surgeries done a year in the U.S. And there's actually not enough ophthalmologists. So, you know, that's pretty good job uh, security, huh? And I love doing it. And I love figuring out the best way to do it for the patient. And each patient's unique. And that's part of what I really enjoy about it is what's right for one person is not right for someone else and talking it through. And, you know, the best thing is having a happy patient at the end. And I know all of the cataract surgeons here at Harvard Eye feel the same and, um, you know, feel very um, heartfelt that, you know, that you would entrust your eyes to us. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, if you have any additional questions regarding prices or anything else, please feel free to leave your contact information on the post webinar survey that will show up after you log off. Uh, there will also be a link on your follow up email um, from Zoom tomorrow. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us tonight. And good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you.